Well, hey there. This iceberg chart is sort of a chronicling of a very, very almost hyper specific subgenre of video game that doesn't really have a fitting name, in my opinion. They're these games. You know this, you've seen this, right? First person, point and click, makes you feel weird, you know, in your bones creates an inescapable sense of loneliness combined with a hypnotizing desire to find purpose in a strange world. Yeah, there are so many games like this. And here in 2023, meme culture started coining these terms like, like you know, liminal, weird core, dream core. All right. We all started honing in on this idea of images that stir these unusual but familiar sensations in us. Lonely, surreal, unpopulated places that we can't help but imagine getting lost in. In the 90s and early aughts, artists were cranking out these worlds with immaculately curious vibes in the form of video games. And one of my community members went ahead and made an iceberg chart that creates a real rabbit hole of this bygone genre. This video is also probably going to be the longest I've ever made, so if you're anything like me, you're probably dangerously overstimulated and can't fall asleep unless someone is slinging verbal globs of information at you. If you're anything like that, then this video is for you too, so you know, Turn it on and just and just doze off 10, 15 minutes in. You won't regret it. So anyways, without further ado, uh, thank you to Just a Feline for creating this chart and helping me with my research. And now, <clears throat> let's dive in. Mist. In September of 1993, Cyan Studios released Mist, a first-person puzzle game in which the protagonist finds themselves transported to an abandoned island filled with mysterious books and strange devices. Mist was a very different title at the time of its release, and it quickly became the best-selling PC game of all time, due in large part to its infectiously interesting tone and setting. Mist's realistic yet primitive 3D graphics and melancholy music created a deeply eerie sensation that seemed to persist in the minds of all who played it for years to follow. The Mist series in its entirety compromises the first tier of this iceberg, in part because they're incredibly well known, and also because Mist is probably responsible for creating this genre. Mist was the runaway success that convinced people that they had a secret impulse to feel perplexed by a video game. And a lot of folks would refer to games like this on this iceberg as mist-likes, and I think that's an okay term. To me, it feels like calling every first-person shooter a half-life-like. You know, it doesn't really roll off the tongue, and I think it's a little bit of a leap in logic, because like Half-Life, Mist wasn't the first of its kind, it was just a very strong benchmark for other people to aim for, and eventually surpass when making a certain type of game. A lot of entries on this iceberg predate Mist, and plenty of them do a lot to step outside of Mist's shadow. So, well, you'll see. Riven. Riven came out in 1997, and it was the first direct sequel to Mist. Riven picks up after the events of the first game, and its visuals are a lot sharper and more realistic than those of the first game, trading a sort of romantic dream core for like a nostalgic and surreal Jules Verne vibe. Riven really tries to get the absolute most out of every one of its vistas. It's got piercing blue water and these crazy perplexing structures and super ornate interiors to rooms. Playing Riven it feels like you were a kid and you got lost at the beach and suddenly you just stumbled upon, like, a scientist's weird reality that they made. Riven is widely regarded as a perfect sequel, improving on its already stellar source material in pretty much every way. And it's getting remastered pretty soon, so if you don't think you'd enjoy a game from the 90s, you can look out for the remaster. I bet it's gonna be pretty cool. Maybe check it out. Mist 3 Exile 
Mist 3 was released in 2002 and was the first Mist game not to be produced by Cyan Studios, instead being developed by Presto Studios, who you'll see again later on in this iceberg. Other than that, Mist 3 has all the main attributes of the first two games, pre-rendered environments, real-life actors and FMVs, and point-and-click gameplay. Modern technologies were used to their fullest in order to make this game's visuals as realistic as possible, and this entry was the first to implement fully panoramic images instead of flat ones, which allowed the player to turn their head 360 degrees from any given location, which is pretty cool. This game introduces some new and unique environments, all of which have very consistent and well-considered art direction that make them feel super well interconnected, despite their distinct tones. Gotta love it. Mist 4 Revelations Mist 4 was released in 2004 and was developed by Ubisoft. Revelations, once again, holds true to the original formula in all of the important ways, but it does do some light retconning of the first entry in the series, and it adds some unique mechanics like a camera and the oddly satisfying ability to tap objects and hear what they sound like. Oh yeah, that's good. While still being a strong entry into the franchise, Mist 4 was a bit experimental with some of its mechanics, and it definitely represented the twilight of the point-and-click genre, at least as AAA releases. It does resolve an important plot thread left behind by the first game, though, and Mist 4 leans much more into the psychedelic than previous entries. It uses spirituality and reform as central themes. Uru. Ages Beyond Mist. The black sheep of the series, Uru was a bit of a departure from the formula of previous games. Released in 2003, Uru was developed by the original Mist studio, Cyan Worlds, and while the core gameplay of solving puzzles was consistent, Uru utilized real-time 3D graphics and 3D modeled characters as opposed to live-action ones. The game was also designed to be played in the third person as opposed to first, but there was an option to play it in first, just like all of the other entries in the series. There was also an MMO expansion to Uru called Mist Online Uru Live, really getting clunky with the titles, in which players could solve puzzles together and interact in hub areas. Uru was met with some complaints upon its release, but it was undeniably ahead of its time. It had incredibly detailed and realistic graphics for 2003, and it had roughly a textbook's worth of lore woven into its story, and the scale of it was absolutely massive. While it did have a very interesting story, Uru was by far the most complex entry in the series, and its puzzles are some of the most difficult and obtuse ever to be put in a video game, but it's remembered fondly by the Myst community, and there's a fan revival of the online game that's still going strong. Playing Uru feels weirdly nostalgic, even if you've never played it before. Its curiosity-filled visuals and hypnotic complexity really make you feel like a dumb kid messing around with a computer game that your mind is simply not ready for. Remember, like, playing a game for the first time and you just didn't do like, oh, oh, what key? oh, the D key moves me to the side? That's crazy, that's weird, I don't know, glad I figured that out. You know, you're just, you're, you're totally out of your depth when you're playing Uru. Mist 5, End of Ages. Mist 5 was released in 2005, and it's actually more of a direct follow-up to Uru than of Mist 4. Confusing title nomenclature aside, Mist 5 essentially plays like Uru with a strictly first-person perspective, and the interesting addition of a gameplay mechanic involving drawing symbols on tablets. It's a little bit gimmicky, but it's a nice way to mix up the point-and-click gameplay with something a little different, and the graphics and story follow in the footsteps of Uru. It's the last of the series, both in release and chronologically, right, in the, in the overall missed timeline. Like Uru, it adds a lot of additional lore to the series, and it does its best to wrap everything up in a satisfying way. And, um, yeah, okay. This concludes the surface of the iceberg. That was the mist only stuff. Now for the crazy, obscure stuff that probably no one's ever heard of. But maybe the first few, still. We'll see. The Seventh Guest 
The Seventh Guest, released in 1993, was a horror puzzle game developed by a studio called Trilobite. The game touted very similar graphical achievements to Myst, pre-rendered 3D environments, full motion video of real actors for its cutscenes, and vast interconnected areas filled with logic puzzles. While they did release in the same year, The Seventh Guest came out five months prior to Myst, and it was also a smash hit at the time, selling millions of copies. Seventh Guest and Myst are both largely responsible for elevating the CD-ROM into the mainstream market, and like Myst, The Seventh Guest has been re-released for various platforms and is even getting a VR remake very soon. So the reason Seventh Guest is a little more obscure now is probably because it's kind of got a more cliche Haunted Mansion setting. The story involves the player character reliving a series of murders that took place inside the mansion of an insane toy maker named Henry Stauff, solving puzzles created by Stauff in order to escape. While the Haunted Mansion theming is a little generic, it's definitely elevated by the dimly lit 3D rendered graphics. Plus, the seventh guest manages to transition between its scenes with a proper animation, whereas Mist just kind of uses a dissolve. And the animation's pretty slick. The interesting visuals, puzzles, and adult-oriented story made Seventh Guest a pretty effective horror title, although a lot of games that use live-action actors tend to inadvertently make themselves feel a little bit campy with shoddy camera work and odd or just novice acting and, uh, well, less than authentic costumes. And Seventh Guest is really no exception. It has a lot more of these FMV segments than Mist does, and I think that's aged it pretty significantly. Return to Zork. 1993 was a big year for weird core point and click adventure games, and in early September of that year, Return to Zork entered the scene. If the name Zork sounds familiar to you, then that's probably because it might actually be one of the most important games in history. Zork was a text-based adventure game in which players navigated a fantasy world by typing out responses to written blocks of text. It was like a virtual choose-your-own-adventure book, and it came out in 1980. So the Zork series was a bestseller by 1985, and it's considered the grandfather of interactive storytelling and RPG gaming. Return to Zork was the first entry in this series to use uh, graphics at all, and Return to Zork is a little more rough looking than the likes of Myst and Seventh Guest. It did have some interesting gameplay features though that the other games lacked. It had uh, you know, an inventory system, several different endings, and the ability to talk to and even kill some of the NPCs, which doing so almost always resulted in a game over, but you know, you could do it. That counts for something. The game also had a few detrimental bugs that affected its overall reception significantly. However, like the others, it was well received enough at the time and sold plenty of copies. That being said, it's really inelegant looking. It feels almost uncomfortable <laughs> to look at, but at the same time it's hard to look away, you know, like a like a like a car wreck. I also feel weirdly bad for the live action NPCs. For some reason it feels like they're trapped in like this this low poly hellscape where there's no sustenance or comfort and yet they can never die. I don't know, maybe that's just me. The Eleventh Hour. Jumping right back to the seventh guest, the eleventh hour was the sequel to that game that I just said. Released in 1995, The Eleventh Hour sees the player take on the role of a journalist, investigating the disappearance of his lover and colleague, along with a string of grisly murders in upstate New York. Classic. The game was originally intended to be released the same year as Seventh Guest in order to maximize the buzz created by the first game, but because its development was started not long after Seventh Guest's, The Eleventh Hour's visuals are only slightly improved, with high resolution images and a more detailed walk cycle for the transitions, but otherwise, you know, it's got some striking scares. It also has its fair share of camp in its live action cutscenes. And uh, you know, overall, it didn't do as well as the first game, but it's got plenty of that eerie liminal charm. So maybe, you know, maybe give 11th Hour a chance. I don't know, I haven't played it, but maybe, maybe you can.
The Witness. Jumping to something a bit more modern, The Witness was released in 2016. The game was directly inspired by Myst, and it was designed by Jonathan Blow, who was also the game designer behind Braid. This game's a bit different from most of the entries on the list because it's very nearly a point-and-click puzzle game, but rather than solving various logic puzzles with different objects, The Witness asks players to solve a very specific format of puzzle over and over and over again, with varying degrees of difficulty and various types of clues. There isn't anything in the way of an overt story in The Witness. The protagonist is completely silent, and they are free to explore the game's 650 or so puzzles at their leisure. Like Myst and many other entries on this iceberg, there are no instructions or tutorials in The Witness. The mechanics must be understood through pure trial and error. The creator of the game estimates that it would take the average person 80 or so hours to finish all the puzzles in their entirety. The Witness borrows a lot of aesthetic cues from modern game design. It's a fully real-time 3D engine with a huge spectrum of bright, flat colors that make the visuals both extremely pretty and rather soothing. The perfectly mirrored surface of the water and the crisp, clean lines make the entire world feel oddly tidy. The lack of texture really sets this game apart from many others on this list. It feels almost sterile compared to the crunchy textures of something like Mist or The Seventh Guest, and I suspect that this design philosophy serves two purposes. One, it makes any visual cues needed to solve a puzzle much more obvious, as environmental juxtapositions are critical hints for a lot of the mazes that this game throws at you. And two, it helps the player stay in a calm, state of mind while they try to solve the endless onslaught of line algorithms. <laughs> it's hard to get mad at a game that looks like this, but according to people who have played The Witness, uh, you, you, still, you still get a little mad sometimes. Zork Nemesis Zork Nemesis released in 1996, and it was a big jump up visually compared to Return to Zork. The colors are a lot less harsh, and the sound design is much more nuanced than that of the former title. The tone of this game is a lot darker and more serious than Return to Zork, and the performances of the real actors are implemented in a, a, a much less cursed feeling way. There's also a lot stronger focus on detailed architecture and immersive interior spaces, which makes the visuals feel pleasant and unified. In fact, I dare to say, this is the best looking game we've seen so far outside of the Myst series. This game is also an early adopter of fully panoramic visuals, which were totally unseen at the time. The look of this one reminds me a lot of the Elder Scrolls series, after it made the jump to 3D with Morrowind. And it makes me wonder if this game serves as an inspiration for Morrowind and Oblivion. Zork Nemesis received really pleasant reception upon its release, with critics citing its puzzles as being the only underwhelming aspect of the game. Now, considering it's a puzzle game, you know, maybe that's a deal breaker for you, but I guess it wasn't a deal breaker for the critics, I don't know. The Journeyman Project series. Alright, back to where it all began. In 1993, Presto Studios, who I mentioned earlier in the video because Presto Studios made Myst 3 in 2002, but they haven't done that yet. That's time travel, so let's go back, to let we can time travel back to 1993, when they released The Journeyman Project, full circle, bam, a science fiction game in which a TSA agent travels through time to save the world. TSA, standing for Temporal Security Agency, of course. I don't know what you thought I meant. The Journeyman Project was definitely an outlier among its peers. It had more complex mechanics, an inventory system, a compass, pop-out notifications, a mini-map, and more. It's all organized in this really slick UI, and it's pretty surprising to me that this one came out in 1993, because its visuals are stellar as well. The skeuomorphic UI frames like a, like a Frutiger Arrow future aesthetic that really makes this one stand out. Everything is super visually clear, and the quality of the 3D renders is, is just impeccable. There is one catch, however. 
it ran terribly upon its initial release. The game was just way too high fidelity for most home computers, and it took ages to transition between new scenes. The following year, the first game was overhauled and re-released as the Journeyman Project Turbo, which seemed to fix most of the problems that the original had, and a sequel was released in 95 called Buried in Time that focused more heavily on historical environments because, well, the series actually does involve time travel, so... I, I don't know, maybe they could time travel. Maybe they went to the future where they made Miss 3. I don't know. Um, okay, sorry. In 1997, they remade the first game retitling it the journeyman project pegasus prime and it was considered to be like a director's cut it helped to unify the elements of the first game with the events of the second did a little bit of retconning you know and it really really nails the future aesthetic this time this is this is so clean this is like a 2002 pop music video if i ever saw one then came the journeyman project 3 Legacy of Time, a beautifully cinematic game that was meant to serve as a bookend for the series. The third game was also one of the first games ever to be released as a DVD-ROM, and this allowed for enhanced video segments that the development team used to their full effect. There's really cinematic camera work and carefully rehearsed acting in this game, and a fourth one actually did enter development, but it never came to fruition, as around the same time, Presto Studios had begun working on... Boom! Mist 3! It's 2002! We're back! We took the long way around! And, you know... But unfortunately, they, they... I don't think they really had time travel, because Presto Studios became defunct in 2002, which, uh, spelled the end of the Journeyman Project series and the whole company, so... Oh, that's... okay. That was a sad ending. Zork Grand Inquisitor Zork Grand Inquisitor is the twelfth game in the Zork series, and it was released in 1997. The game takes place 120 years after the events of Zork Nemesis, and sees a return to the series' more goofy and satirical style, albeit this time with a production value that makes the whole thing feel a lot more cohesive. The cutscenes of this game read like a series of Monty Python sketches, which creates a pretty fun and unique tone, actually. And the visuals are a nice development on Nemesis's, with a similar attention to detail but larger focus on fun swirling lines and warped funhouse style shapes to let the player know not to take things too seriously. Abduction. Abduction was released in 2016 by Cyan Worlds after a successfully funded Kickstarter campaign. By this point, it had been over 10 years since Cyan had released a Myst game, and Abduction was advertised as a, a spiritual successor to those. The story follows a silent protagonist who's been abducted by aliens and now must navigate several different extraterrestrial planets, solving puzzles, and learning the stories of all who came before. Abduction is playable in 2D as well as VR, and despite being a modern title with real-time 3D graphics, it still uses live-action actors for all of its human characters, giving it that, that little dash of the FMV charms of yesteryear. The result is a pretty sharp-looking game that creates an almost uneasy feeling whenever another human being is shown. The realism of the human characters makes the abandoned alien environments feel even more isolating and distant from home. The 3D graphics are as close to photoreal as a game engine could be at the time, but the people remind the player what reality actually looks like. And they combine familiar things from Earth with eerie alien structures to create a really unique juxtaposition. Abduction was well received and proved that liminal point and click adventures are still an excellent way to build an immersive world, so you know, you still got it, Cyan. Hat tip to you. In fact, we can use the hat from the Presto Studios logo because they're because they went they went out of business. Oh, oh I made myself sad again. Drowned God, Conspiracy of the Ages. Alright, it's time to get weird. Drowned God, Conspiracy of the Ages, released in 1996, and remember that show, Ancient Aliens on the History Channel? Yeah, that show 
was a shameless ripoff of this spooky point-and-click puzzle game. No, I am not kidding. Drowned God Conspiracy of the Ages is a point-and-click adventure game that explores various theories and conspiracies involving human history, including, and kind of first and foremost, the idea that the planet Earth was seeded by aliens who oversaw our development. I know that memes have pretty much ruined anyone's ability to take that idea seriously, but at the time it was a really, it was a crazy idea in sci-fi. And, you know, Drowned God presents itself as fiction, not a real documentary that people should listen to. So the point of the game was just to discuss the idea that recorded history is not a perfectly reliable and fixed form of understanding, even though we would all like it to be. And the story also created an intriguing thread of paranoia for the player to follow along their journey. The plot of the game is adapted from a forged manuscript written by Harry Horse in 1983. Horse tried to make it appear that the text had been written by a 19th century poet named Richard Henry Horn, as the two shared a birth name. And I know you're confused, so Harry Horse was just a pen name, and after having trouble selling the forged manuscript, Horse, aka Horn, the guy's real name, decided to shelve the project for a decade until he played Myst in Seventh Guest, and those games made him realize that the manuscript story would probably be best delivered as a point-and-click adventure game in the same style. Because sometimes you need that spark of the uncanny, I don't know. The story was widely praised, but the overall response to the game was a little more mixed. A sequel was planned, but not much came of it. I gotta say though, the visuals really succeed at being dark and spooky in a way that most of the entries so far have failed to accomplish. This is... this is... this is a raw uncanny. There's a natural uneasiness that comes with these fixed perspective puzzle games, but this one capitalizes on that effect real well. And Drowned God manages to avoid any of the corniness that the other entries on this iceberg sometimes carry, which makes the whole thing feel potently unnerving. And finally, because I know some folks may mention it in the comments if I don't, the creator of the game, Henry Horn's body, was found embracing the body of his wife in 2007. Both corpses had well over a dozen stab wounds in them, and there's a lot of poor journalism and negligent police investigation around the circumstances of their deaths, and I have no interest in dramatizing that or speculating on such a thing as some of my peers here on the internet have chosen to do, so... Uh, that's all I'll say about it. If you want to learn more, you'll have to do it somewhere else. I'm just here to talk about the art. Sorry. Firmament. Another modern title, Firmament is Cyan's most recent game. It released this year, May of 2023, and Cyan Worlds seems to have a keen interest in VR as a platform because Firmament can be played in 2D or virtual reality, and it does a really nice job of creating an immersive and interesting world for players to explore without worrying about time limits or, you know, game overs, health bars, that kind of thing. But it does utilize VR to its fullest with its gameplay. Because it's so new, Firmament is probably the most approachable game on this list, so I won't go into too much detail about its story, but I will mention one bit of controversy that the game received after it was released. Firmament was made using AI-assisted technology. This wasn't disclosed during its Kickstarter campaign because the technology didn't really exist yet, and this made some backers pretty upset once the game came out. Cyan later released a statement regarding their use of the technology, clarifying that AI was only used as a tool to enhance or edit existing work done by the development team, real human artists. Nothing in the game was AI-generated, meaning made from scratch using a tool like Midjourney or ChatGPT. Many AI tools are just better versions of existing software tools that are used for larger creative workflows, like I don't know, rotoscoping or spell checking. So people kind of got all up in arms for the modern equivalent of like Microsoft Clippy. Clippy, how did you know that I was writing a letter? What data were you trained with? And can you show me what Adventure Time would look like as an 80s 
dark fantasy film? Oh, hell yeah, that's sick. Cosmic Osmo. We're still talking about Cyan. So before Myst, they developed CD-ROMs that were more in the vein of interactive storybooks as opposed to true puzzle games. One of their most successful was this thing called the Cosmic Osmo and the World Beyond the Mackerel. The interface was point and click, but unlike the other games we've discussed so far, there's no goal beyond exploring and discovering all the little secrets the game has to offer, and there really aren't any logic challenges to complete, you just move through the environments. Obviously the game is illustrated as opposed to 3D rendered, but the illustrations themselves are really, really nice. The visual clarity is really impressive considering the whole game is composed of black and white with some stipple, and it brings back memories of my second grade classroom in elementary school. There was this old Macintosh in the corner of the room that had some black and white games like this on it, and the interactive storybook format probably inspired a lot of the humongous entertainment titles like Pajama Sam, which I totally played as a kid. Starship Titanic Starship Titanic was released in 1998, and it was written by Douglas Adams, who if you don't know, is the author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. In the game, the player must repair an enormous spaceship and interact with NPCs in order to progress the story and gain clues on how to proceed. The game sets itself apart by using a text-based dialogue system called a text parser, which means the player could type in responses to NPCs rather than selecting from a list of dialogue options. They would get a pre-recorded response rather than a text-based one. The development team recorded around 16 hours of dialogue in order to make this work, and it was pretty ambitious for the time. The spaceship's interior uses art deco architecture and set design, which gives it a super unique style that's very well suited for the graphical limitations of those early plasticky 3D renders. That being said, some of the NPCs look a bit goofy in this game, even for robots. And one little bit of finesse that I really enjoy in Starship Titanic is this little blur effect when the player turns to look at something else. It's cleanly done, and it gives traversal a really satisfying feel. The Manhole Plot twist, we're talking about Cyan Studios again, but this is the last one we're going to talk about for a while, and it's pretty important, because The Manhole was the first game developed by the studio all the way back in 1988. It was very much in the same vein as the Cosmic Osmo, a simple interactive story with point-and-click elements, and it served as a great exercise for the creators of Myst, Robin and Rand Miller, to learn about the techniques and software that they would be using as indie developers. In the game, the player was able to climb up a vine, which grew out of a mysterious manhole cover in the middle of nowhere, and explore unique and interesting worlds that emphasized engaging and surreal visuals, rather than any written story or clearly defined plot. Like the Cosmic Osmo, it was an exploration simulator, with nice illustrations and the occasional animation, mostly intended as something to keep the kids busy, but honestly, anyone could pick this one up and have at least a little bit of fun. Quern. Quern is a modern love letter to the liminal puzzle genre of yesteryear. It was released in 2016, and a follow-up is in development with an as-of-yet unannounced release date. Quern was created by four grad students and found moderate success after its release, getting positive reviews on Steam and even getting ported to the Xbox One in 2020. Other than that, it's a textbook example of a classic liminal puzzle game with a voiceless protagonist and plenty of mysteries to uncover. It is a great pick, though, for anyone who wants to experience a semi-nostalgic title in the vein of Myst, but with a little more polish, a little more modern features, and that's much easier to get up and running than a lot of these ancient CD-ROMs. If you've got an Xbox One, you can enjoy a liminal point-and-click puzzle adventure. I bet you thought you couldn't, but you can. Lighthouse, the Dark Being Lighthouse the Dark Being, released in 1996, tells the story of a struggling writer that is transported to a parallel dimension through a portal located inside a lighthouse on the Oregon coast. The game springs for 3D characters over FMVs, which results in a slightly different vibe than Myst, but the game is very much a Myst clone, and I only say that because 
The lead designer claims he was literally shown a copy of Myst by his boss and asked to duplicate it. That being said, he did put very careful work into the duplication process because the narrative and design of this game is on point. It does use an inventory system, but that's really the only thing that sets it apart from Myst from a gameplay standpoint. But I've got to say, this one feels a bit above average in its general tone and visuals. I'm a sucker for intriguing technology, and I think that was a huge point of fascination for these games. It's one thing to see a neat landscape or an alien world, right? But interacting with just like a puzzling doohickey that you've never seen before feels really, really special. And the design of a lot of this game's tech seems to come from nautical equipment and instrument panels. And I don't know, there's just a lot here that works. Unfortunately, around 1996, critics were very reluctant to give Mist clones very much acclaim, but they do submit that the story and graphics are really solid, but otherwise they just kind of toss this game in the mediocre bin for some reason. Spaceship Warlock Spaceship Warlock was a super stylish cyberpunk adventure game that came out in 1991. Yeah. 1991, two years before Myst and Seventh Guest. This game is one of the earliest released on the iceberg, and it looks... radical, dude. There was actually a variety of gameplay styles in it. Most of it was point and click, but NPC interactions were text-based, and there were some more arcade-style segments to mix things up. I have a feeling the creators of this game just watched Blade Runner and then dropped acid, and then immediately started programming somehow, but I don't know. I'm not sure what the plot of Spaceship Warlock is, but I am certain that they did not need to give this NPC such photorealistic eyes and lips. My God, I, I feel so uncomfortable when it moves. Yeah. Spaceship Warlock is one of those crazy anomalies that was so far ahead of its time that it somehow failed to be recognized as the breakthrough that it was. I think the main reason is that Spaceship Warlock's graphics seem to still be mostly 2D, and it uses drawn characters instead of FMVs, so I think it lacked some of that flashiness that the pre-rendered 3D environments had. The graphics are super stylish, though, and Spaceship Warlock was a hot seller in 1991. It was the best-selling CD-ROM on Mac until Myst came out, so maybe I'm wrong to say it wasn't successful. I just think it's odd that it wasn't remembered. Eastern Mind, The Lost Souls of Tonguno Eastern Mind is a 1994 point-and-click adventure that is... It's really, really different. The game was created by Japanese artist Osamu Sato, who you might know as the creator of LSD Dream Simulator. The story of Eastern Mind is about a man named Rin who loses his soul and has it replaced with an artificial one that will last 49 days. In order to regain his soul, he must travel to the island of Tonguna and face a series of trials in order to recover it. The game uses themes around concepts of spirituality, including reincarnation and animism. It was localized to English in 1995, and its reception was... yeah, it was mixed. Most Western reviews had no idea what to say about it, and most just called it confusing or disturbing or otherwise unusual, which is fair, I suppose. The game's visuals lean very, very heavily into the psychedelic, with abstract, undulating shapes and bright neon colors. It doesn't try to be photoreal in the way that other titles did around this time. It doesn't even try to look coherent. Instead, it seems to use the dissonant quality of 3D graphics to make the whole thing feel like a terrifying nightmare of some kind. The character design really adds to this, with many creatures just being amorphous clusters of shapes with human-like eyes attached to them. And this photorealistic green head just, it, well, it just speaks for itself. Just look at it. The game became very rare for a while until modern gamers rediscovered its wonderful weirdness. Its sequel, Chu Tang, was actually lost media until 2013 when it was anonymously uploaded to the internet. And 
that concludes tier 3, but we do need to go deeper. Obsidian. Obsidian came out in 1997, and it was a respectable, but not all that uncommon, attempt at recapturing the initial enthusiasm around Myst for something new. They ran an award-winning ad campaign with fascinating commercials that created a lot of pre-release excitement for the game, but oddly enough, Obsidian sales were absolutely abysmal compared to most of the games on this list, selling only 14,000 copies in its first year, despite rave reviews from critics. It failed to rake in any significant revenue initially, and after the pricey ad campaign, the developer Rocket Science Games was essentially abandoned by their publisher Segasoft and was forced to close their doors not long after. Over time, the game's quality continued to shine through though, and sales steadily rose and it gained a dedicated cult following. The game mostly takes place inside the subconscious minds of three characters in the year 2066. The visuals are what you'd expect from the year it was released. They're sharp, detailed environments with tons of bizarre, skeuomorphic contraptions. The three different minds create three different aesthetics for their respective areas. One bureaucratic, one scientific and mechanical, and one creative and lush. Obsidian does everything right. But it's entirely possible that with Riven releasing the same year, it had an uphill battle that it just couldn't win. One more interesting thing about Obsidian was that it had a 20 questions minigame that would ask the player to feed it more data if it lost. By storing what the player told it after losing a round, the algorithm was able to learn to be better at 20 questions. And that's pretty cool, I think. The game is about a rogue AI, so it was interesting of the developers to include an AI algorithm for beating 20 questions that was theoretically infinitely capable, although the amount of data that you would have to feed it would be obscene. Haven Moon. Alright, well, yeah, this game is just a really lovely looking spiritual successor to the Myst series. With Jules Verne-inspired visuals and minimalist single-mouse controls, Haven Moon is a nice, relaxing stop on this rabbit hole of an iceberg chart. The game was released to the Steam store in 2016 by indie developer Francois Roussel, and is a self-proclaimed mist-like, coming across as a bit of a love letter to the franchise with some refinement and personal touches thrown in along the way. The visuals are really stunning. The game is so realistic looking that it makes me want to stand in some of these environments myself. I feel very calm when I look at this one, and after the past few entries, that is a welcome sensation, to be sure. The Dark Eye. Alright, we're getting weird again. The Dark Eye is a psychological horror game that was released in 1995. The game is heavily influenced by the stories of Edgar Allan Poe, even adapting some directly, specifically The Telltale Heart and Bernice and the Cask of Amantillado. The Dark Eye is pretty intriguing for its use of stop-motion puppets with highly expressive clay faces. This really fuels the Uncanny Valley effect, and some of the scenes have the potential to get under your skin as a result. The voice acting in this game is also absolutely stellar, and it's an important addition to its gothic horror vibe. The game didn't get much press upon its initial release, but it has since been recognized as a super unique and original horror game, and Richard Downs worked on this game. He's an illustrator that also worked on Riven, so that's pretty cool. Shivers. Shivers was released in 1995 and developed by Sierra Online Studios. Shivers plays like an episode of the 90s Goosebumps TV series. The protagonist is a teenager who has been dared by their friends to spend one night in a haunted museum where two kids and the museum's founder supposedly vanished years prior. After being locked into the abandoned estate, the player must travel deeper into the museum and uncover the secrets of its exhibits and artifacts. Shivers is at times a lot campier than some of the previous entries, but that being said, it does capture a very distinct 90s young adult horror vibe. 
CD-ROMs at the time could have a somewhat limited color palette, and Shivers seems to spring for extremely saturated hues. That, combined with the surreal scale and architecture of the museum, makes the game feel like a funhouse inside the Uncanny Valley. Like many other entries on this list, the Shivers series has a cult following of fans who still remember it fondly to this day. Shivers got a sequel in 1997 called Shivers 2 Harvest of Souls, which takes place in a ghost town in Arizona, where the player's friends have gone missing. Shivers 2 is more of the same visually, with crazy colors and weird expressionist architecture, but its mediocre reception has left it fairly obscure. Its Wikipedia article is absolutely abysmal. Pissed. Pissed was a 1996 parody of the game Mist. By 1996, Mist was easily the best-selling PC game of all time, having sold over 4 million copies by then. So Pist's primary gimmick is the idea that you're the 4 million and first person to visit Pist Island, and the place is essentially just Mist Island if it had hosted Coachella for a year. This game is pretty pathetic compared to all of the others on this list. There are no puzzles or story. It is literally just a slideshow, effectively a PowerPoint of Mist Island covered in trash, along with a few FMVs tossed in. The jokes are extremely low effort, and it doesn't reference its source material in any meaningful way. But you know, John Goodman was in it. Yes, John Goodman, the actor, he portrays the king of Pissed Island. And if you've played Mist, you probably know just how little sense that makes. I don't want to be rude, but it almost feels like the development team couldn't actually figure out how to beat Mist, so they just made a parody of, like, the starting area. Brutal Moose made a pretty good video about Pissed that goes a little more in-depth, which I will link in the description below if you're interested. Oh yeah, and, um, aesthetics. Yes, this game looks like a pile of garbage. They nailed it. Rhea. Face the Unknown. Released in 1998, Rhea, as it was known in the United States, was a point-and-click adventure game, originally released in Spain before being dubbed and localized to the US the following year. The game's story involved exploring an alien artifact on a distant planet. It was developed by a small team of six people, and Rhea has some interesting design decisions to make it stand out to a degree. For one, the protagonist is fully narrated and voice acted, providing reactions to the various environments and objects the player explores, which is not unheard of, but fairly unique for the genre. Although the design of the alien world seems to be very heavily influenced by Moorish and Egyptian architecture, it does change to a more generic European medieval fantasy vibe about halfway through, and uh, we'll talk more about this series later on, so just, let's just put a, put a pin in that for now. Scratches. Scratches is a horror mystery game about a struggling writer exploring a cursed estate in the year 1976. Scratches was released in 2006, which meant two things. One was that it managed to avoid the mist clone witch hunt that plagued the late 90s, so it received stellar reviews, and two, the quality of its pre-rendered areas is crystal clear, approaching photo real at times because the technology was pretty much perfected by 2006. The game has excellent sound design, and doesn't really include other characters, which adds to the feeling of isolation. The trepidatious piano music in the background gives it an atmosphere of nagging dread. It really makes the player sit with the idea of being alone in a huge remote Victorian estate with no company to soothe the vibe of unease. The game was a hit, landing among the top 10 best-selling computer games of 2006. It was also the first ever commercial game made in Argentina, so you know, hey, great job Argentina, good first impression, bravo guys. SPQR SPQR is an adventure game that takes place in ancient Rome. The player is tasked with preventing the fall of the Roman Empire. <laughs> okay, well, I'm sorry, that didn't work. I'm just kidding. Well, okay, the player does need to stop the fall of Rome, but not the real one that actually happened, a made-up one that would have happened before 
the real one happened. The game relied heavily on puzzle solving. There are no other characters that you meet in person, they're only referenced through clues and writing, but they are very relevant to the narrative at hand, so it makes for a pretty unique experience. The game feels like getting lost in a museum, where accustomed to Roman architecture today in individual buildings, but seeing it constructed as an entire city is really immersive, actually. And I love the skybox of this one. It makes it feel like a super odd time of day, like you woke up and you weren't sure how long you slept and you just started walking the empty streets of the town you lived in. The game came out in 1996, so it wasn't a game changer or anything, and honestly the lack of FMVs made it a little bit primitive for its time, but it was a unique setting for an adventure game like this, and that UI is pretty darn snazzy. Very on theme. I love it. Spelunks. Another pre-Mist Cyan title, Spelunks released in 1991 and was more explicitly focused on edutainment. Spelunks and the Caves of Mr. Swudo was a series of rooms with different interactive minigames and puzzles that taught the player a little bit about various subjects. The game had a second release in 1993 which gave it colored graphics, and Spelunks has a very welcoming and nostalgic feeling behind it, but being targeted at children, its visuals are extremely bright and whimsical and cushioned. It feels like a preschool classroom, and I'm sure that was the goal. Job well done, Cyan. Amber. Journeys Beyond. Released in 1996, Amber, Journeys Beyond, is a bit of a sleeper, in my opinion. Its story is more grounded in reality than most of the other titles on this list, with a sort of Twin Peaks or Stephen King framing, rather than steampunk or fantasy. The events of the story can happen in many different orders depending on the player's choices, and the modern setting makes this game feel overwhelmingly liminal at times. Trading perplexing libraries and stonework for dimly lit suburban homes and empty dirt roads flanked by trees. I'm also pretty fond of the technology design in this series. They look as if Leonardo da Vinci made cell phones and laptops in the 90s. It's all quite unique, and at the time of its release, critics seem to be particularly harsh about Mist clones, as we've established earlier, and they lumped this game in with the rest of the lot. They praise the puzzles and story, but cite a lack of originality in game design as justification for giving this game three stars. Right, because everyone knows that a true five-star game only uses original and unique game design concepts that have never been seen before. No repeats, no pause menus, no first-person perspective, and you better invent a new color for your graphics, and it better run on a cabbage, because no games have ever run on a cabbage before. Everyone uses computers, and that's why everyone only gets four stars. Anyways. After a while, Amber Journeys Beyond became a lot more appreciated for what it was, a neat experiment in a proven genre, and it was the only game ever developed by its studio, Hugh Forest Entertainment. And despite taking home a few awards for the year that Amber Journeys Beyond released, there just weren't enough sales to keep the lights on at the studio, I guess. It's too bad that they couldn't make more games, but if they wanted to please the critics, I mean, they should have just invented a new color. Or at least a new shape. I mean, it's not that hard. Remember when Minecraft invented the cube? No one else gets to use cubes now. They did it once, and they nailed it. Good job, Minecraft. 10 out of 10. Game of the year. That's why we love it. Titanic. Adventure out of time. I hope you enjoyed preventing the fall of Rome. Now, prevent another famous historical disaster. World Wars 1 and 2. That's right, this game isn't about preventing the sinking of the Titanic, it's about traveling back in time to the night the Titanic sank in order to prevent every world war. <laughs> Interesting narratives aside, the game uses a very accurate 3D model of the Titanic as its setting, and navigating the ship is done with arrow keys instead of the mouse, which allows for very fast and smooth movement across the ship. I think this game is one of the few on the list where your in-game walking speed feels significantly faster than it does in real life. This dude is running around the Titanic like he is Sonic the Hedgehog. 
Another cool thing this ROM does is it populates the ship with a decent amount of NPCs to talk to, and they all have dialogue options that adapt based on the character's actions. They're real actors, but they used this odd puppeteering method of animating the mouths to make the still images talk, and I'm gonna say it's a little creepy, but I'm guessing it was necessary to get all of the dialogue in. There is a lot of it. The game was released in 1996, and it did okay for itself, but even back then, the critics cited the character animation as a little bit unsettling. But, you know, both world wars still happened, so mission, mission failed. The Eyes of Aura. The Eyes of Aura is another, more contemporary, liminal puzzle adventure, released in 2016 by an indie dev named Ben Drost. The game places the character in an abandoned castle with no specific goal aside from solving puzzles and learning about the castle's mysteries. The game is unique in the fact that it treats the environment or castle itself as a character, and the lore comes from various perspectives, which results in the narrative getting quite muddled or even contradictory at times due to the various interpretations of events that the player has to weed through. Like many other games on this list, it's meant to be an introspective and methodical experience through an intriguing world. I really enjoy the way this game uses technology. The castle is clearly ancient, but it has since been retrofitted with more modern tech, so there's this cool blend of magical fantasy and technology. Schism. Remember when I talked about Rhea and promised that we'd circle back? Well, here we are. Schism, Mysterious Journey, is its sequel, and while it might look pretty cut and dry at first, it has one unique feature that sets it apart, and I've gotta say, it's, it's quite cool. The game has two protagonists, and the players can switch between these protagonists at any time. And later on in the game's story, the two interact directly and communicate. The setup is that the two characters, Sam and Hannah, are running a supply ship to an alien planet called Argulus, but are forced to abandon the ship shortly after arriving. This separates them into two unique and uninhabited areas. The game came out in 2001, and it does a really nice job with color and texture specifically. Designing something to look alien is a notoriously difficult task, and Schism handles it well with structures that blur the line between organic and inorganic, a sky that feels only slightly familiar. The game was a moderate success, enough to earn a sequel in 2003 called Schism 2 Chameleon. The sequel traded renders and FMVs for a fully real-time 3D game, and it made this jump pretty elegantly, to be honest. Almost nothing feels lost in the way of detail between these two games, and the smooth animations as well as the freedom of untethered movement work really well here. The design of the sequel feels like a blend between Half-Life and Morrowind, which has no bad ingredients, in my opinion. The NPCs still look goofy as heck, but that's just early 3D graphics for you. We weren't ready to put characters in in-engine cutscenes yet, but we certainly tried. Atlantis series. Alright, this one's a bit odd because, uh, well, there are five of these games. You see, they were sort of a smash hit in Europe, and between 1997 and 2006, they, they made five of them, but they're all for this one entry, so just, just strap in and we'll... Take a deep breath and we'll, and we'll get through it. Okay, so obviously the series is themed around the idea of the lost city of Atlantis, which was a pretty hot topic for alternate history fiction. They all have pretty similar gameplay, admittedly with more emphasis on dialogue and cutscenes than many other games on this list. Interestingly, they also don't use any FMV sequences for their characters or cutscenes, opting for 3D models from the beginning and every game has a different protagonist who you get to look at during the cutscenes, which is another hot take. As for the visuals, uh, I'll go ahead and fire off my thoughts on all games real quick. Okay, so uh, Atlantis The Lost Tales. The environments are nice looking enough, but this came out the same year as Riven, and the colors and general design don't feel like much to write home about, to be honest. And, uh, the, well, the NPCs are a little off looking, but this was the late 90s, so you know, I'll give it a pass. Let's see about number two. All right, Beyond Atlantis. 1999, still sort of missing the mark on color and detail, but 
I feel like a certain style is starting to emerge here, and the NPCs... Uh, oh, oh my god, it has a face. They put a... Oh, they put a human face right on there. They just used, like, a picture. Like, a photo of a man, and it... it he... Oh, oh, he has a face. And they put a Fu... They put a Fu Manchu over that guy's real face. They put a little fake Fu Manchu on him. <laughs> okay, alright. Uh, we still got number three. Okay. It's 2001 now. Okay, this looks very nice. I see you got lots of different texture there. You got some unique environments. This is the best looking one so far. And oh, all right. You know what? The real face over a 3D model technology has improved. That looks that looks fine. I'll say it. That looks fine. They got that working good. Uh, for these, okay. But some people have full 3D faces. So that. Is that like a race? I don't know. I'm not. I'm gonna. I'm not gonna touch that. Number four. Okay, so 2004. Bit of a time jump between those two, and the gameplay looks nice. All right, it's lush. It's a little nostalgic. They decided to do like a like a fable type thing. I think with the people. It's kind of kind of stylish. Uh, all right. Overall, feels like a little bit of a step back technologically, but and. Number five. Okay, so that this this one takes place in the late 1930s. So that's Art Deco. Okay, we're in Art Deco, New York. Okay, all right. You know what? This looks pretty rad. Ten out of ten. The NPCs look like they were made in Second Life, but that's okay. You got to choose your battles, and this these games kind of lost the battle with NPCs and people. But it's time to it's time to move on. We 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 found Atlantis, and and this is what we got. Take it or leave it. REM series. So far, I've avoided using the term mist-like because while a lot of entries on this iceberg can be described that way, I prefer to come at this from a perspective of more general intrigue and curiosity. And most of the games on this list do have at least one or two unique features or stylistic choices that distance them from the mist series. That being said, the REM series is an exception, just because it's very clear that this game is actually working rather hard to invoke the same vibe as Myst 1. But that's not a bad thing, alright? There are four REM games, and they were all seemingly the work of one man, a German indie developer, visual artist, and composer named Newt Muller. Muller manages to create a visual style and tone that matches that of the original Myst 1 perfectly. And that sounds simple, but it really isn't, especially considering that the REM series was released in 2003, which means the game was built on software that is way, way newer than anything that was used on Myst 1 10 years prior. The REM series has received pretty solid reviews from fans of the point-and-click puzzle genre, and uh, yeah, there are four of them, each of which took about two years to develop. Rem is a love letter to Mist, as well as a creative exercise for an artist who is clearly trying to tell their own story from atop the shoulders of giants, and I can totally respect that. All four Rem games have very similar visuals, but they manage to nail the stuffy, foggy aesthetic of Mist with new set pieces and puzzles to explore. So, hat tip to Newt for creating such an interesting and obscure series. It's the perfect way to experience the classic Mist vibe without retreading old ground and repeating the same puzzles if you're a longtime fan. Bad day on the midway. Alright, um, we've hit tier 5, so... It's, it's gonna get real weird from now on, and it's gonna stay about that weird the whole time, okay? So just strap in, put your listening ears on, try to make sense of everything that's gonna come out of my mouth, because this one is genuinely hard to explain with words. In 1995, a multimedia music group called The Residents directed an interactive 3D ROM experience called Bad Day on the Midway. There were no puzzles or goals in this game, but it did have gameplay, primarily in the ability to switch between the perspectives of several different characters, all of whom are visiting this garbage pale kids-esque midway on the same day. The characters' thoughts are displayed at the bottom of the screen, sometimes they're reactions and sometimes they're just random exposition or ideas. The point of the game 
if it has one, is to experience all of the different character stories and interactions before the game ends when the clock strikes midnight. There are also multiple ending scenarios. Bad Day on the Midway is at times creepy, bombastic, funny, cynical, and just flat out bizarre. The game's design is very, very effective in making it feel like a sickening fever dream of some kind. Characters are deliberately hideous and abrasive, colors and shapes are headache-inducingly bright and twisting, and the result is pretty much total sensory overload from start to finish. It even has a completely unique transition animation that was unlike anything else around at the time. I mean, look at that weird, crazy blur. It's like you astral project from one scene to the next. Bad Day on the Midway was applauded for its interesting stories, genuinely cool character swapping gimmick, and overall entertainment value. Ron Howard even tried to get David Lynch to make a show based on it, but a script was never settled on. Yes, Twin Peaks David Lynch almost made a whole ass show about this weird, disgusting little game. Bioscopia. Chemicus, Physicus. Bioscopia, Chemicus, and Physicus are three sister games released in 1999 and 2001, respectively. All three games feature practically identical gameplay, but the main distinction is that each one focuses on a distinct field of science. Real science, meaning that they're educational and applicable to real life beyond their entertainment value, but they have plenty in the way of entertainment value. Each game has its own story and setting to tie it into its respective field, being of course chemistry, biology, and physics, respectively. The cool thing about these games is that they look really nice, borrowing much of their steampunk aesthetic from other entries on this list, but tossing in a dash of fantasy design elements to strike a unique balance. I specifically enjoy Chemicus's hub design. The reason these are so low is that these three games are really only the tip of the series. There are many others in this series of edutainment point-and-click adventures that teach you about real life, but unfortunately most of them are just too obscure to add much to the conversation. I can barely find anything about some of them, but the other subjects taught were math, history, and music, among some others. Cosmology of Kyoto Oh look, here's some more weird. Released in Japan in 1993 and the US in 1995, Cosmology of Kyoto is a Japanese historical horror game that takes place in ancient Kyoto sometime around the year 1000. The game was completely non-linear, allowing the player to explore the unprecedentedly large city freely. The gameplay used a blend of point-and-click and, and text-based elements, and it also had a karma system and a character creator. So for 1993, it was a super fully featured game. It even served as an educational tool to contextualize the events of the game within real-world history. The visuals are perplexing. Um, most of them are not 3D rendered in the way that a lot of entries on this list are. Instead, they're like these detailed illustrations, sometimes foreshortened to create the illusion of 3D. The NPC designs are like caricatures, sometimes with photoreal lips, which is really uncomfortable looking. The city is vast and crowded, but at the same time it feels desolate and confined. Cosmology of Kyoto seems to have its fair share of disturbing moments in it, and the black fog and purple sky make the whole thing feel nauseatingly dreamlike. Beyond that, the game really plays with your spatial awareness. None of the distances really make sense, so when your character walks, or more accurately, teleports somewhere, it feels a lot like movement does in a dream. It received extremely favorable reviews, both in Japan and the US, but it hasn't really had much more than a cult following since its initial release 30 years ago. But hopefully that will change, because there are plenty of interesting tidbits about this game that I just didn't have time to include here. It's really its own rabbit hole. Darkfall Darkfall refers to a series of games released by developer Darkling Room. Oddly enough, the first game came out in 2002, and then the series took an 8-year hiatus before starting up releases again in 2010. Then two more games came out in 2013, and then another in 2020. 
That has been a really weird release cycle, but they did make some similar games outside of the series in between. The Darkfall games are horror titles which are all about hunting the paranormal, Ghost Hunters style. The tone of the games is actually pretty similar to Phasmophobia, albeit with a lot more set decoration and a much richer story. The series seems to have something of a cult following, and its developer specializes in atmospheric, single-player ghost hunting experiences that lean more into immersion than shock factor. The series makes good use of the vaguely uncomfortable feelings of these liminal adventure games, the players exploring empty suburban houses that feel very lived in. It's a quality series that's definitely stood the test of time. Aura, Fate of the Ages. This one's kind of just here to break up the weird a little. It's a textbook point-and-click adventure game from 2004, and it borrows more than a little from Myst, with its story relying heavily on the creation and exploration of unique parallel worlds. It uses 3D characters instead of FMVs, and gives itself a more arcane fantasy vibe, but otherwise it's just a neat-looking obscure game from 2004. I do think the design is a little above average. It's hard to make environments that stand out, but the atmosphere feels pretty unique, even compared to other titles in this genre. There was also a sequel called Aura 2, The Sacred Rings, but it's really just more of the same. Both of these games do seem to struggle a bit with their voice acting and sound design, but you know, that's not unheard of, so nice try, guys. Let's dive back into the weird stuff. The Museum of Anything Goes The term surreal gets tossed around a lot in this video, but it goes double for some of these titles, and that is definitely true for The Museum of Anything Goes. It's hard to tell what this game was trying to do originally. It shares its basic principles with the Cosmic Osmo and the Manhole, the only difference being that those were charming and coherent animated worlds, and this is a weird core scrapbook fever dream that either purposefully or accidentally ends up profoundly disturbing the player. The FMV sequences were mostly filmed in Chicago, and they are authentically uncanny with their noise, aberrations, poor color grading, and eerie lighting. This particular type of home VHS footage is frequently imitated in modern media, and it's clear why, but this is a classic example of something slightly out of date aging into something that is seen retrospectively as, well, cursed. There was even a rumor that this game showed a real dead body in one of its sequences, but luckily that was debunked, which means ghosts probably won't be crawling out of your PC if you try to play this, but you know, I won't promise anything. I didn't make the game. I don't know if they put any spells in there. Amazon. Amazon, The Explorer's Legacy, was released in 1999. The game is pretty interesting. The player is a journalist who ends up continuing the life's work of an elderly explorer who is nearing death. That's a dead guy, if I ever saw one. I know he's moving around, but that's just like... He's got strings attached, or there's like a bunch of little mice inside of him animating his body. That's... I don't think he's nearing death. I think he's there. But, sorry. Anyways, the story takes place in a fictional region of South America called the Amazon. And yes, believe it or not, it was inspired by the Amazon rainforest. It's a really subtle reference, but if you look for it, it's there. It's a little on the nose. Anyways. The game is actually able to create a very distinct environment inside this fictional jungle. They feel authentic and grounded despite the fictional setting, which helps make the player feel like they're actually exploring an uncharted part of the planet Earth. I also love this game's inclusion of speculative zoology. There are several types of made-up flora and fauna in the Amazon, many of which have beautiful illustrations to add that extra degree of detail. Other games on this list have fictional creatures, but Amazon does a pretty excellent job of making the player feel like an outsider among its ecosystem. In fact, the game's story is centered around a species of magical white birds native to the Amazon. The birds have a pretty detailed and unique life cycle in the animal kingdom, and I'm just a sucker for good world building, so I'll be darned if I don't want to visit the Amazon myself. 
Labyrinth of Time. Back in 1993, The Labyrinth of Time was another point-and-click adventure game that never landed the audience that the seventh Gaston Mist did. The story involved the main character getting sucked into a labyrinth of time. Yeah, it's, it's essentially a maze that exists on a different plane of existence, which allows the player to travel through space and time. The gameplay was unfortunately a bit repetitive, as it relied heavily on placing the character in actual virtual mazes, which are really not very fun to experience in the form of a slideshow. That being said, the atmosphere of this game is pretty rad. The scenes are satisfyingly symmetrical and tidy without sacrificing texture and detail, and the background of the menus and inventory are a really pleasant looking, hued static. Huh. Anyways, Labyrinth of Time seems to be a lot more fun to look at than it is to actually play, so, well, we've looked at it. Now let's look at something else. Gadget, Invention, Travel, and Adventure. If you take one thing away from this video, it should be that for some reason, 1993 was the year that humanity miraculously converged on a particular, unspoken style of game. Gadget, Invention, Travel, and Adventure was also released that very same year, and it did a few things differently. For one, its story is very linear, and there's only one ending, which sets it apart from a lot of other open entries on this list. The story places the character in the role of a secret agent in a retro-futuristic Eastern European country, who's tasked with finding a missing scientist. The game's tone is a bit eerie. It feels like an abandoned Wes Anderson film. There are other characters, but they always appear alone, standing in vacant train stations, or sitting solitarily on a random bench. The game also springs for statuesque but detailed 3D models, as opposed to FMVs, with text blocks serving as their dialogue. It looks nice enough, but it feels pretty unnerving during gameplay. They're just so still, they don't even breathe and occasionally there will be a jump cut to a slightly different expression or something, and it's oddly startling, but otherwise they're just statues. This game is one of Guillermo del Toro's favorite games of all time, and Cosmology of Kyoto is also on that list, which I would say is surprising, but it's Guillermo del Toro, so that tracks. He's... that guy's on a different wavelength. Watch his movies, they're awesome. Total Distortion. Alright, this game feels pretty special. It manages to do something unique with this genre without being too avant-garde or just straight up confusing to players. Although it does manage to dial everything up to 11. Total Distortion is a super groovy looking game about a music video producer exploring a liminal place of existence called the Distortion Dimension. The goal of the game is to produce successful music videos, have pleasant dreams, and fight a giant guitar playing robot. It's a miracle that Tenacious D wasn't involved in the creation of this game. It released all the way back in 1995, and for something made only two years after Myst, it does a lot of fascinating experimentation. As you can probably already tell, the game has a pretty strong sense of humor. One of the game over screens has over a million views on YouTube because it features an original two and a half minute long song just about how the player is now dead. It feels like one of those crazy, hyper violent, over the top game over screens that you'd see in a comedy movie that's like a parody of the entire video game genre. The whole game is jam packed with a max headroom style charm, and I think I'm itching to play this one. I don't know. What do you guys think? Would you like to see it on stream? Nine, The Last Resort. Produced by Robert De Niro and Jane Rosenthal, Nine, The Last Resort released in 1996 and included the vocal talents of Cher, James Belushi, Christopher Reeve, Tress McNeil, Steven Tyler, and Joe Perry. In other words, a ton of people who were super famous in the 90s worked on this game. This one is deeply surreal and tells the story of the protagonist inheriting a hotel from their uncle, Thurston Last. Get it? Last Resort? 
because because the uncle's last name was last. Clever. The visuals seem to share a lot of DNA with Bad Day on the Midway, although the overall production value is a little higher in Last Resort. Most of the puzzles involve music or sound, and there's sort of an overarching musical code that the player becomes familiar with as they make their way through the game. It's always nice to see when a game fully commits to a more out there visual style. The Last Resort manages to balance psychedelic design with a more reserved and bland color palette, and plenty of visual clarity for navigating its various environments. Personally, I've never played it, but I really feel like I've just seen this cover art before. Does anyone else recognize this monkey? No? No, just me? Okay. Chin. Okay, so in 1996, Learn Technologies Interactive Incorporated decided to do something totally against their company values. They used technology to incorporate interactive learning in a video game. I know, crazy, right? Totally out of left field. Jin, Tomb of the Middle Kingdom, is a game that takes place in 2010, which was 14 years in the future at the time of the game's release, of course. The player is a researcher exploring an ancient tomb in China when they are trapped inside a deeper series of chambers by an unexpected earthquake leaving the tomb's secrets as their only hope for escape. It's a nice enough setup, but despite the tension implied in the narrative, the game seems extremely zen in its tone. But paradoxically, the puzzles are also extremely challenging. They reward a player that reads about Chinese history and pays careful attention to the educational information offered up in the game. The look of it is very light and airy. The spaces are clean and minimalist, which is kind of a departure from the norm. There's also a somewhat painterly quality to the visuals, especially in the exterior vistas. There were four possible endings to this game, each of which was a result of the four possible choices the player could make in the game's final act. Unfortunately, this one didn't make much of a splash upon its original release, so it remains more or less obscure. Blue Ice I have to warn you that as we go deeper into this iceberg, some of these entries are going to start to feel more avant-garde than your average cut-and-dry video game. Blue Ice is more of the former. It was released in 1996, and it uses photographs of real people and objects wherever it can for its graphics. It takes place in a fictional kingdom where there are literally millions of laws. The laws were created by insecure monarchs who used them to cover up their own mistakes and shortcomings. The player takes on the role of the next successor to the throne, and they must learn through exploration and puzzle solving that many of the laws are infractions of life's most basic pleasures, art, music, food, love, and nature. There are 28 separate rooms, each of which contains a puzzle that pertains to one of these pleasures. But there is an entire second layer to this game. It was originally conceived as a contest, designed to be so difficult that whoever managed to solve it would win a million British pounds. Now, keep in mind, there was never really budget to do that, but the game's developers nevertheless left a series of extremely well-hidden and cryptic additional clues that serve as ingredients in this ultimate challenge. Players were encouraged to write in the solution and send it to the devs to win... bragging rights? Maybe a prize? No one really knows because no one ever won. The true ending screen that you achieve by solving this master puzzle was never actually programmed into the game because the developers didn't want anyone cheating on the contest by rifling through the game's files. But no one ever won the contest, partially because the game didn't sell all that well and partially because the ultimate challenge is inconceivably difficult. To this day, no one is known to have ever even come close to solving it, and if they did, they'd have pretty much no way of knowing unless they were fully aware that the true ending wasn't actually programmed, so they just took all of their notes from playing and their overabundance of confidence and used that to write a letter to send to one of the game's original designers to see if their made-up ending matched what was originally intended by the programmers. And you know, if they did, then that person would then be able to 
call their mom and say something like, Hey mom, I beat blue ice. Here's a drawing of the end screen that I made on a napkin. The developer says it's really close. But then, the other end of the phone call would be to a deadline, because they would realize that their mom had died six years ago. It took them over a decade to beat blue ice, and they haven't spoken to any of their loved ones since 1997. We should move on. The Daedalus Encounter. This one manages to flip the script in a super interesting way. Most of these games are very solitary experiences. Even with the occasional FMV or NPC to talk to, a lot of these are spent wandering alone most of the time. The Daedalus Encounter places the character in the role of Casey, a former space marine whose brain has been grafted to the life support systems of a spaceship. Your former partners, Ariel and Zack, stole your remains from a military research lab after an intergalactic war ended, and they wired you in so you could join in on their fresh start as salvagers. One thing leads to another, and the ship crashes into a mysterious biomass in the middle of space, and the three of you have to work together to solve puzzles and escape. This is honestly a very cool setup. Being a brain trapped in a computer makes the concept of a UI and solving puzzles with only mouse clicks feel very well implemented. And the actors behind Zack and Ariel actually do a stellar job of creating chemistry between all three of you. Ariel is played by Tia Carrere, who's an absolutely fantastic actress with a long and storied career. Most of the game takes place in various rooms inside of the weird organic biomass, and the designs are a really interesting sort of alien fractal coral reef type deal. It tries its best to look good, but it was 1995, so a lot of rendered environments are lacking a bit in clarity. The game leans a lot more into its movie-like quality though, and it's a bit less interactive than a lot of the other entries on this list, but it's always nice to see something different, so props to the Daedalus encounter. Prince Interactive Prince Interactive was a CD-ROM that was sort of a marketing gimmick, maybe a collector's item? It revolved around the musician Prince, and it came out in 1994. It had a few puzzles and, you know, stuff like that in it, but the main draw of this piece of software was all of the Prince content it included. Songs, music videos, interviews, and other video clips. Not a lot else to say about this one, it was just a, a, an experiment with technology that was trendy at the time. It doesn't do anything groundbreaking, and the visuals are pretty much just that of a tacky looking recording studio from the 90s. Ooh. I'm seeing here that the game's setting was based on Paisley Park, a real-life recording complex where Prince did most of his musical recording at the time. Oh, jeez, I, I feel terrible. I really hope their interior designer doesn't see this. I didn't mean to hurt anybody's feelings. The Crystal Key A lot of these titles initially sell poorly, but receive positive reviews upon release, and eventually become appreciated for what they are. The Crystal Key inexplicably does the exact opposite. Released in 1999, The Crystal Keep was an unprecedented success despite drawing almost zero positive feedback from reviewers. The game's story was about an invasion of evil aliens called the Osgar. The player uses portals to travel between alien planets in order to thwart the invasion of Earth, and that's it, that's the whole story. The game is also very buggy, as it relies heavily on QuickTime VR to achieve its panoramic visuals, and the game does have some beautiful vistas, but it also has some incredibly mundane and downright confusing environments at times. And considering it was released in 1999, the graphics seem a little more in line with things that were coming out years prior. The Crystal Key doesn't accomplish what any of these other titles do, and yet it somehow managed to sell more copies than most of them, and got itself a sequel in 2004. Time Lapse This one has a story more grounded in historical fiction. Time Lapse sees the player rescue their friend, an archaeologist who's become trapped between dimensions through an experiment involving, that's right, you guessed it, time travel. 
1996 was a pretty busy year for liminal puzzle games like this, and at this point, critics were very wary of the genre, but Time Lapse still got solid reviews. They really decided to crank the color saturation on the renders of this game, and I gotta say, I respect that decision. Every single screen looks like a Windows XP background, or the cover of a Vaporwave album, or something. Timeline becomes pretty dream core for the crazy bright colors alone, and the FMVs are all presented through these snazzy, round displays. In fact, games like this seem to really love round displays, and, and you know, I do too, they're cool. I think we overcommitted to rectangles, and I think we should film more stuff in circles. I'll say it. Byzantine. Byzantine The Betrayal is a murder mystery game set in modern day Turkey. Modern day, of course, being 1997, because that's when the game came out. It combines its story with an educational element, as it was published by the Discovery Channel's game studio, and it was the first in what was intended to be a series of world explorer games. The idea was to use an interesting plot to organically explore detailed reconstructions of historical and culturally significant locations from around the world. The game strives for photorealism, and it uses real photos whenever it can for its backgrounds. All of the FMVs were also shot on location in Turkey, but green screens are still used to superimpose the actors into new backgrounds. Byzantine received very positive reception, which is impressive considering how often edutainment software like this just turns into lazy shovelware. It also has a bit of a 90s spy movie flair to its design, with green digital graphics on black backgrounds and a crazy PDA-style gadget that the player carries around. It's a shame that Discovery didn't produce more games like this. It kind of works. Ring. This game is pretty funny because it's trying to be super highbrow and artsy, but it completely fails at those efforts. Ring, The Legend of the Nibelungen, is a space sci-fi adaptation of a super famous German opera by Richard Wagner called Der Ring des Nibelungen. The original opera is about 15 hours long, separated across four individual performances, so the game only manages to cover about half of it. The story takes the spark notes of the opera and dresses it up as a crazy sci-fi space fantasy designed by a French comic book artist named Philippe Drillet. It sounds super intellectual and artsy, right? Well, the game is very cool looking, but it's also kind of funny? It doesn't really utilize its fascinating sci-fi visuals as much more than set decoration. And so the dialogue is still super theatrical, but with the crazy character designs and kind of janky 3D animation, the entire experience feels goofy. Mandalore Gaming compared it to an episode of Xavier Renegade Angel, and I think that's accurate. The puzzles were also extremely contrived and illogical, which led to the game getting less than favorable reviews. It sold quite well despite this, which meant it wasn't a total loss, but the studio was trying to make, like, you know, the avatar of point-and-click adventure games. And speaking of Mandalore Gaming, he did an hour and a half long deep dive into this game and its sequel, which I definitely recommend watching in lieu of actually playing it yourself. Faust. You know what this genre needs? It's more adventure games based off of German literature. I mean, that stuff is so liminal point-and-click 90s puzzle game, right? Okay, I know I just talked about Ring, but what if I told you that the same developer, Axel Tribe, made another video game adaptation of a famous German story? Well, I did just tell you that. So that's fun. Faust, also known as the Seven Games of the Soul, was a loose adaptation of the Faust legend. The game was a complete flop, in part because its visuals were absolutely brutal looking for 1999, with design cues clearly borrowed from other 3D adventure games, and the same food fight-esque character animation that we got from Ring, but critics also noted that the story felt a bit pretentious. In fact, Axel Tribe in general had a weird air of superiority about the games they made. Faust was intended to be a cultural object, rather than, you know, a video game, which is what it was. You know, a lot of games do become cultural objects because 
they're good. It's almost like they tried to skip over the part where people enjoy the game and talk about it and tell their friends to play it and it informs their lives and just tried calling it a cultural sensation to see if we'd all be tricked. There really just isn't much here. Jewels of the Oracle Jewels of the Oracle was a puzzle game released in 95, and this one's pretty bare bones, sporting a sort of vaguely Egyptian, Persian, Mesopotamian kind of art style. A series of 24 puzzles are arranged in 24 escape room-esque scenarios. There's no story, just puzzles and graphics. There are really no frills here, but the repetition does make it feel a little Sisyphean. Most games try to mix up the aesthetics, but Jules is more like a, a treadmill in purgatory. It's just the same over and over and over again, but I guess that's pretty liminal. Rama. Based on a book by Arthur C. Clarke, Rama is a sci-fi adventure where the player takes the role of an astronaut tasked with exploring a mysterious cylinder that has entered the solar system, dubbed Rama. It is discovered that Rama is something of a space megalopolis containing multiple alien cities which each house a different species of extraterrestrial. The gameplay takes some cues from the Journeyman project, using a Pip-Boy-esque user interface device called the Wrist Comp as its frame, which gives the player more options than the standard point-and-click format. Rama was developed by Sierra Online, and while it did sell reasonably well by most standards, they were a big software company, and perceived the game's more modest sales as a failure. Reviews for the game, however, were very positive. Rama definitely has a unique premise, and being based on an established novel makes the world feel a bit more fully realized than some of the other titles on this list. Its environment design feels very reminiscent of sci-fi epics from the 70s and 80s, like the original Star Wars trilogy, Dune, and 2001 A Space Odyssey, but with a dash of color that helps give the game a more distinct identity. The FMVs are nice enough, but in the 90s it's really clear that most actors were not accustomed to standing in front of green screens and performing, so it feels a bit stiff, but that can be said about most of the games on this list. Morpheus. It was hard to find information on this one. It was released in 1998 and was the last game ever produced by its studio. Only 50,000 copies were printed in the US, but it was very popular in Spain. The game takes place in the Arctic Circle. The player takes on the role of an explorer, searching for their father who vanished under mysterious circumstances 13 years ago. When I first started looking into this game, I was taken aback at how high quality it looks. It's easy for a lot of these titles to sort of blur together, but Morpheus stands out in the sheer variety of well-executed aesthetics it manages to capture across its runtime. Frostpunk, Art Deco, Frutiger Arrow, Jules Verne, Victorian, Moorish, Tropical, and more. I just can't really conjure titles for some of these. I think one of the most intriguing things about these games is how many of them are doomed to obscurity despite being genuinely fascinating, at least from a storytelling standpoint, and Morpheus is no exception. Zed Zed is a modern VR title released in 2019, developed by Eager Games and published by Cyan Ventures. For those who don't know, Cyan, creators of Myst, are primarily developers, but they also have a publishing department called Cyan Ventures, which publishes indie VR titles, mostly. Zed is one such game, and it tells the story of an aging artist navigating their dementia-addled mind and reflecting on their life. It's one of those surreal, lonely dramas in the vein of Gone Home or Dear Esper. The visuals are pleasant, albeit a little generic, and it falls this low on the iceberg mostly because it's pretty obscure for a game that came out in 2019, but that doesn't mean it's bad. I haven't played it. Book of Watermarks in 1999, the world had a hole in it. And that hole was shaped like a Japanese puzzle adventure game released exclusively for the PlayStation 1, loosely inspired by William Shakespeare's The Tempest. Luckily, the Book of Watermarks was released, and it filled that hole. Don't worry, I'm as confused as you are, I promise. In case you're not familiar with Shakespeare's The Tempest, I certainly wasn't, it involves a character named Prospero who is in possession of a library of magical books. 
In the game, 13 of the books in question are the most important, containing collectively nearly the entire sum of human knowledge, which makes all the other books in the library a little redundant, in my opinion. Prospero tasks the player with collecting 12 of the 13 books by solving a series of puzzles inside the library. Despite the fact that the game was released exclusively in Japan, its dialogue and text is mostly English, making it easy for Westerners to pick up and play. The game was targeted at adults, with a more intellectual approach to storytelling, and cutscenes that feel more like the ramblings of an excited college professor than an actual narrative. It's really interesting to see a game so steeped in medieval European theming, but developed from the perspective of Japanese game designers and artists, because the tone of this one is really oddly immersive and exciting. The interest that the creative team had in Renaissance literature, Roman and Gothic architecture, and the other art of the era is absolutely infectious, and every cutscene is played over this early 2000s pop beat played with string instruments and old flutes and stuff, and it feels weirdly nostalgic to me. The game's aesthetics remind me quite a bit of another gorgeous PlayStation game out of Japan called Ico, which was released a few years later, and I think it's the juxtaposition of medieval stonework with the bright and lush exteriors. The library in Book of Watermarks also sits on a small island, in a very similar way to the castle in Ico, so it's possible that there were maybe some design cues taken from this one that were used for Ico, but that's pure speculation on my part. One final thing I'll say about this game is that it has silky, smooth movement for transitioning between scenes. Other games on this list manage to do this, have a, a nice little animation between where you are and where you're going next, but something about Book of Watermarks is very elegant and floaty, which adds to the music video-esque dreaminess of the whole thing. Nile. The title might be a giveaway here, but this one's all about Ancient Egypt, which if you didn't know, was actually around for a really, really long time. America has only existed for 1 15th of the time that Ancient Egypt did, so as you'd imagine, this game had a lot of historical ground to cover. It was released in 1997 and published by Simon & Schuster. The player must rescue three pharaohs from the Old, Middle, and New Kingdom eras of Egyptian history. Interestingly, this game included renderings of some real artifacts, which were borrowed from the Metropolitan Museum in order to be recreated accurately in the game. Aside from that, though, this one's just a slightly underwhelming bit of edutainment software. They really nail the desolate desert vibe, but it stresses me out how open everything is. I feel like I'll get lost. Where am I supposed to go? It's all sand. Anubis does look pretty neat. No human body for this guy today. He's in full jackal mode. I can respect that. Nicopel. Nicopel, Secrets of the Immortals, was released in 2008, which is a bit of an outlier when it comes to release dates for this style game. Nicopel is based on a graphic novel called La Foriox Immortals. It's sort of a dystopian cyberpunk noir drama with a crazy floating pyramid, evil dictator, absent father, and aliens. Funnily enough, the year it takes place is 2023, of course. Gosh, you gotta love that 2000s technological optimism. No, sorry to disappoint. We spent all of our energy turning smartphones into dopamine dispensers, perfecting the Ponzi scheme, and teaching computers how to do people's jobs. Not the awful, inhumane, or menial jobs, mind you. We taught them how to do the fun, creative freelance ones first. We'd like to invent flying cars, but unfortunately the dopamine phones have given us the attention span of rabbits, so it's extremely difficult to perform any type of long-form activity now. Anyways, Nicopel is much more fast-paced than most of the other entries on this list, but that really just boils down to many of the puzzles having an urgent time limit, which makes them frustrating to work out because you have to repeat the same sequence over and over and over again. It received mediocre reviews pretty much across the board, and it honestly doesn't have a whole lot going for it visually. Sometimes it manages to take advantage of the rendering technologies of 2008, but overall, the visual fidelity is comparable to stuff that was coming out five years prior. 
The grungy, post-apocalyptic city vibe is definitely effective and admittedly a unique setting for a game like this, but otherwise Nicopol is as obscure as it probably ought to be. Peter Gabriel's Eve. Here's a game that's, um, sort of a music video? Peter Gabriel is a singer-songwriter who you might recognize, or maybe not, depending on your age and music preferences, but he's had a pretty active career, and apparently a long-standing interest in the genre of video games, because in 1996 the game Eve released, with his name heavily attached. This one received positive reviews, but it was definitely more of an art project than a game. The visuals are a bit more flat than other entries on this list. The game relies on photos and cutouts more than pre-rendered environments, which makes it feel kind of like a scrapbook, and the best way I can describe the tone is, well, it feels like walking through a bunch of random MTV music videos from the early 2000s. Imagine the music video for, like, Virtual Insanity, but but you've got to, like, synchronize Jamiroquai's floor sliding with the music in order to progress the game. That exact puzzle isn't in it, but you get the idea. It's, it's an art project. It has a right to be weird and experimental, but actually it got pretty favorable reviews compared to more polished contributions to the genre at the time. And I think it was probably because this felt more like snobby museum gallery art than something like Amber Journeys Beyond, which is a little easier to criticize, but approachable if you're, you know, a human person who wants to have fun playing a computer game. But one interesting fact about Peter Gabriel is that he did an original song for Uru, and he also appeared in Mist 4 as a disembodied singing uh, spirit guide type thing. So he's a, uh, you know, Guy likes music, guy likes video games a little less than music, but still still enough to, to contribute. So, thanks, Pete. The Grand Moomin Party. Moomins. You know these things? You ever see one of these things? Probably just a random guy you saw on the internet once, you know? Maybe it was holding a gun. That was pretty crazy. Or maybe you're from Europe and you know all about it, you know, I, I, I don't know, I don't know your story, I don't know your life, but either way, we're talking about it today for the iceberg, okay? So, Moomins are the main characters of a series of Swedish comics, cartoons, and other media which are very popular in Finland. There have been Moomin books, TV shows, movies, two theme parks, and in 1996, there was a Moomin computer game, voiced by the cast of the cartoon that was running at the time. The game sees the player helping the Moomin family plan a spring festival. The gameplay is comprised mostly of interactive chores done in preparation for the festival in question. You know, gather ingredients for a cake, put some nice invitations together, assemble fireworks from raw components under a strict time limit, enter father's treacherous nightmare about flying a hide air balloon in occupied airspace in order to help him escape from the dream realm. All of these are staples of party planning really, especially for a spring festival. And at the end, you get to hand deliver the invitations by bringing them into town on the world's slowest and most confusing train that takes half of the whole game to navigate. I mean, you you will spend half the game looking at this. Look at it. This is the real map. They just, gee, I, it's just, it's like the London Underground over there. I mean, who, who could, uh, don't, don't get lost. Outcry, Sublastrum. Outcry is a psychological thriller released in 2008 for CD-ROM. In it, the player is a writer who receives a letter from their brother asking them to come visit. When the player arrives, they find their brother's home is abandoned. The player finds notes from the brother referring to some kind of experiment, and they must continue their brother's research in order to find him. This game is also, um, it's, it's really bright. And I don't mean that tonally, I mean it literally, visually. The main thing it seems to do differently is that it favors these just like searing bright light sources in as many environments as it can pack them into, as if the whole game takes place at high noon on a summer's day in the Arizona desert. And it's actually pretty cool, you know? It makes most of the game feel like a mirage inside of a valley of scorched earth. 
Outcry is just another hidden gem, a solid point-and-click puzzle game that you can use to impress your friends. Oh, I've played this, I've played that. Have you ever played Outcry? It's so bright, it's like Arizona. Sentinel, Descendants in Time. Published by The Adventure Company, who, believe it or not, is now responsible for several titles on this iceberg, Sentinel, Descendants in Time was released in 2004. And well, it's Uru. Uru has a first-person and third-person perspective, and this game feels just like Uru in first-person mode. The story even involves a mysterious civilization who created interesting machines inside of unique worlds, and now it's all abandoned, which, if you don't know, is basically the spark notes of the plot of Uru. That being said, the game isn't shovelware, it seems to be good enough, it tries hard at its goal, I mean, it's just a little bit of a copycat, you know, I calls them like I sees them. Of Light and Darkness. Hey, Fallout fans, here's a name you might know, Interplay Entertainment. Yeah, that's right, they published this guy in 1998, and it's your classic sort of save the world from the apocalypse story. You know, you gotta convince a bunch of powerful spirits to not create world-ending disasters. Just good old-fashioned negotiation. You know, art of the deal, that kind of thing. The game touts 51 procedurally generated characters and 50 character-driven puzzles. I'm not sure what any of that means, but it, boy, it sounds impressive, that's for sure. It's got aesthetics, more in line with Nine and Bad Day on the Midway, kind of bombastic and chaotic, you know, sort of acid trip energy. Interestingly, the box art for this game stirred up some controversy with retailers. Costco refused to carry it because the box art was too provocative, which is 1998 speak for this artwork feels gay somehow and that confuses me, so I don't like it. Interplay did push back on these claims, but the controversy, unfortunately, wasn't enough to drum up better sales. The game was a commercial flop. Mystery Island 2 Released in 2001, Mystery Island 2 is... not a sequel, as far as I can tell. It is a sci-fi game made in HyperCard, which is the same software that was used for Myst 1. Meaning, this game is pretty primitive. In 2001, this technology was about 10 years out of date. It's all text and static images, and there are text-based descriptions for almost everything in the game, which appear at the top of the screen whenever the player clicks something. So that's pretty cool, you know? It's, it's a little extra flair that isn't present in Myst 1. And visually, this game, I think, leans the hardest into the Frutiger Arrow aesthetic. The environments are glassy and shiny and, and bright and bubbly, and even the desert feels like, like smooth, you know? It really reeks of the early 2000s, back when computer code was all green text on black backgrounds, and the future was white and chrome. Good times. Hell Cab. Hellcab was a CD-ROM developed by an 18-year-old named Pepe Moreno, a comic book artist who was interested in the artistic potential of CD-ROMs. Around this time, they were just starting to be seen as commercially viable ways to package and sell games. And Hellcab was more of a tech demo than it was a full-on game. It was sort of an experiment with new technology, and it was only made by one guy. So it was simple and brief, from a gameplay standpoint, but I've got to say, this came out eight months before Myst, and I think it looks better. I know that's totally subjective, and the theming is really different, but the visual clarity here is super impressive. Most of the seams seem to be very carefully arranged 2D assets that get close to photoreal without sacrificing the simplicity of stylized graphics. The textures are sharp and the colors are very well managed, which keeps everything nicely separated on screen. I can tell that this game was made by someone interested in comic book art because every screen is nicely framed and blocked out, like comic book panels. It's really nice, honestly. The only downside to this one was its speed. It was so colorful and dynamic that it could sometimes take quite a while for screens to transition and new areas to load in. 
This was a common issue for CD-ROMs at the time. Disk drives weren't physically fast enough to jump between different parts of the disk to scan new information. The developers of Myst got around this by placing all the scenes in a very specific order, in the shape of a spiral, so that the disk reader never had to jump too far when running the game. But Pepe probably didn't know to do that at the time. But, you know, for a first try, this is pretty remarkable. 1953. KGB Unleashed. This game sees the player waking up in an abandoned Soviet bunker in the middle of the Cold War, with no memory as to how they got there. The protagonist is plagued by voices and hallucinations as they attempt to unravel themselves from the depths of this underground fortress. The game was released in 2010, and its main selling point, aside from the graphics and unique setup, is that it's all based on real events and experiments conducted by the KGB during the Cold War, which involved telepathy and the effect of certain psychological traumas on the human brain. Keep in mind, based on real events can mean a lot of things, and this game is historical fiction, but it's that little grain of truth that does make the whole thing feel a bit more unnerving. I particularly enjoy the low ceilings in most of the environments, and the combination of hospital colors like white and green with military equipment, concrete and steel. It creates an atmosphere of fortified claustrophobia, if that makes sense. The Day the World Broke I feel like it's been ages since we had some good old-fashioned FMVs to look at. The Day the World Broke was a comedy adventure game released in 1998 and targeted at children. In the game, there is a machine that literally keeps the world running, but the machine malfunctions due to a few blunders made by the human engineers that maintain it. The player must help fix the machine by traveling to the center of the earth and solving some simple puzzles, of course. This one does have a really charming style, it feels more like a picture book at times than a game. It definitely has that Where's Waldo watercolor sort of feel to it. The title had a few game-breaking bugs, which for children's software especially is a one-way ticket to the thrift store. I guess just too many kids had to experience the day where the day the world broke broke. Alita. Alita was released in 2003, but it was in development for five years. Like Hellcab, it was also made by just one person, a game designer named Kos Russo. It has a story that attempted to put a new twist on familiar concepts. The game takes place on an island called Alita, which was built as a sort of theme park by a band with the money from their first successful album. The band members each took over different parts of the island, hoarding their share of the money and drifting apart until they all eventually left. Years later, one member returns in the hopes of a reunion, but goes missing. The player is then sent to the island to find them. It sounds interesting enough, but the story almost doesn't fit with the game's actual design. Not to discredit the visuals, they look very nice and on brand for this genre, pretty close to Riven, with their rusty beach aesthetics. There's nothing wrong with it, I just struggle to see how this is supposed to be a theme park built by a contemporary rock and roll band. Unless it's a contemporary rock and roll band that really enjoyed Mist and Riven. That being said, the game received positive reviews, despite being a little late to the party by 2004. It was praised for its story and impressive scale, and it was enough of a success for Cost to continue making games, and it was released for iOS in 2015. A sequel has been discussed as recently as 2018, so who knows what the future of Alita holds. Maya Maya, Return to the Lost Island, is another modern title that seeks to pay homage to a style of game that proved very fruitful for over a decade but has since fallen out of fashion. Released in 2019, Maya is one part of a collection of four games called the Black Cube series. The game's story is pretty open-ended. You're an astronaut investigating a distress signal, and, uh, yeah, you know, things get weird. The game does a good job of balancing its modern technology with the sort of inadvertently liminal aesthetics of some of those games created in the 90s. The textures are detailed, but also pretty high contrast, and 
Most of the geometry is perfectly smooth and uniform, so everything just looks perfectly off a little. But, you know, it's supposed to. It's just off enough to be right on. Does that make sense? I don't know. Reviews for all four games are very positive, and small titles like this are a good reminder that there are a lot of different games out there made by very talented and passionate people. For longtime fans of this genre, things like this are a must play. Riddle of the Sphinx. This one's your standard ancient Egyptian puzzle adventure with a weirdly obsessive attention to detail. The player's mentor goes missing. They need to go to Egypt to solve mysterious puzzles and find him. And you know, bing bang boom, gameplay. This title's main claim to fame is the insane accuracy that the developers insisted on including. The 3D models for the Sphinx and many of the game's environments are completely accurate, and they even included an authentic translation of a scroll that the developers wrote, with grammatical conventions used by the real scribes of ancient Egypt, accurate to the era of history that the scroll was meant to be from. The game was remastered in 2021 and re-released, so if you're an ancient Egypt buff, this one is definitely for you. Secrets of the Luxor. Okay, we got Nile, we got Riddle of the Sphinx, and now Secrets of the Luxor. These are these are starting to blur together a little bit, but bear with me, all right? It is an Egypt point-and-click adventure game. What do you know? Came out in 1996, and you gotta keep the, the you gotta keep the ancient artifact away from the evil Doctor Osiris. Uh oh, it's a little on the nose if you ask me, but. One neat thing that this one did was it included a VR headset mode. Not for real VR headsets, no, no, no. In the game, like on your computer screen, you had a virtual VR headset that sometimes your character in the game would get to use to look at uh, like panoramic pre-rendered environments instead of static still images. <laughs> Imagine if you were playing Uncharted and it had a VR mode, but when you play it in VR mode, Nathan Drake would just pull out a VR headset and then put it on, and it would go like first person or something. But but like you're still playing Uncharted on your flat screen TV, like it's still 16 by nine. So it, it was pretty much that. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it's fine, but this game is only as low on the list because it's something that you just find sitting in like the back rooms because someone just tossed it behind their desk and then they never ever thought about it again and so it effectively ceased to exist and it just it just no clipped right out of reality you know it full-on quantum superposition reset you're gonna forget about it before this video is even over i mean what what, what i what game were we just talking about Mist 4, Adventure Beyond the Denis Ultra World. There was an unreleased, unfinished version of Mist 4 that was in development by a now defunct studio called Dreamforge Entertainment. The game was essentially just a different version of the Mist 4 that was actually released, with the same general premise for its story. The main difference was the fact that Denis Ultra World was going to use real time 3D graphics instead of pre rendered ones which would have made it the first in the mainline series to do this. The game was in development for two years, but it was only about 20% of the way done when Ubisoft decided to pull the plug on the project and developed Miss 4 internally instead. A decent amount of concept art and clips of prototype gameplay have cropped up over the years, and the game looks cool, but honestly, I'm perfectly happy with the version of Miss 4 we got. It seems like the right decision was made regarding this one's development. I'm sure there were some interesting concepts that never saw the light of day, and that's too bad, but you know, everything comes at a cost. Milk. Milk is a piece of conceit wear. Yeah, I hadn't heard that term either, but the creator of the ROM, a guy named Bart Gold, called it that. Personally, I would call milk freeware. It was passed around on a demo disc, and its story sees the player in the role of a cow on a dairy farm. It's really short. It's kind of a self-proclaimed homage to Mist. 
Milk came out in 1994, so Myst was pretty much the most incredible CD-ROM in the world at the time. People were still sort of reeling from what was perceived as the future of gaming. It's incredibly obscure, intentionally bad, and the fact that it isn't lost media is frankly remarkable. I'd make a joke about milking the Myst hype train, but I really can't because the game was free. Chaos, a fantasy adventure. All right, picture this. It's 1996. Your life is perfect. An hour of work, even at minimum wage, buys enough food to feed a family of four. Disney still makes movies in 2D, and the first Harry Potter book comes out next year. But what's missing? Chaos theory, of course. Sure, life is perfect now, but what if all natural systems tend toward disorder? It might take 27 years, but the world could go completely off the rails if we're not careful. What you need, right now, is Chaos, a fantasy adventure game designed to teach people about chaos theory. That's right, this is an edutainment game all about fractals and entropy. The game's story sees the player dodging bill collectors while being drip-fed information on chaos theory by their erratic uncle. The game has a super wacky sense of humor, and those classic, foggy, liminal, weird core graphics that we all know and love. In the game's credits, it's listed as being created by the Interactive Telecommunications Program at New York University's Tisk School of the Arts, and with support from the New York State Center for Advanced Technology at NYU, which is sponsored by the New York State Science and Technology Foundation. <sighs> So they really wanted to be clear on everyone who contributed to this masterpiece that no one really bought. And because of that, chaos now consumes all. Denis Legacy. Denis Legacy is a Myst fan game released in 1998. It's very obscure, so much so that I'm sure it actually had a hard time being distributed to its target demographic in 1998. And the game is brief, but it features six unique areas and a lot of interesting literature that dives deeper into the greater lore of the series and speculates on a lot of things. The visuals are even more primitive than those of Myst 1, but honestly that almost benefits the experience. These games, I think, are at their most liminal when they're extremely bare bones and like barely comprehensible like this. It's minimalism as a result of computational limits as opposed to like a pretentious desire for life to be simple. Graphics like this ask a lot of the player's imagination, while still giving them enough to understand all of the basic necessary information trying to be put across. I really appreciate what they're trying to do here. Environments like this are quite dreamlike. It's like a world barely formed out of clay, you know, like a statue that's only like 15% of the way carved. Part of something feeling liminal, I think, is feeling somehow incomplete or, or barely there, like almost not there. And this kind of nails it. Milo. Milo has a pretty unique premise. A long time ago, an advanced alien race discovered a way to explore the entirety of the universe by traveling through space and time. They decided to use this technology to perform a mass exodus of their homeworld, leaving the planet under the care and protection of an artificial intelligence named Milo. But Milo is sentient, and requires stimulation from the world around him in order to stay balanced and sane, just like you or I would. In the millennia that has passed since his creators left, Milo's mental state has declined, and the player has to now fix him. It's a pretty cool idea, and a great reason to explore and solve puzzles inside of an alien world. Unfortunately, the puzzles were essentially just mini-games. Some of them are even luck-based as opposed to logic-based. The game has a nice Stargate sort of look to it, and the idea of being literally the only flesh and blood person alive on an unoccupied planet watched over by a massive AI is really ominous and interesting. Milo fell into obscurity pretty quickly, however, and it's almost entirely forgotten, which is why it's so low on the iceberg. Riven. Riven? Or maybe just Riven? I'm not really sure what the phonetic intention of this spelling was, is, uh, well, it's lost media. Basically, in 1998, a guy named Justin Fisher was playing Riven, and he was loving it. 
specifically the interesting objects and textures. So he started working on making some little 3D models and knickknacks of his own, as he was a programmer himself. It quickly spiraled into a mini online Riven clone called Riven. The game was really just a tour of Justin's models, I think, and playing it revealed information from Justin's personal Riven notebook to help stuck players beat the game. The kicker is that Justin himself hadn't yet beaten Riven, so he had no clue how helpful his notes and tips would actually be. So while the Wayback Machine does have snapshots of all the blog posts surrounding Riven, written by Justin, the game itself is completely gone. The only surviving scraps are these pictures of a telescope model that Justin made, and this gif of a linking book. For any Doom fans out there, Justin was also the creator of one of the first total conversions for Doom. It was called Aliens TC. It was extremely popular, there are several YouTube videos about it, and after it was released, Justin received multiple offers at different game companies, but he was still in college at the time. Once he graduated, he got a job at the now defunct Mad Genius Software, but other than that, Justin seems to have faded into the world of game development. It's hard to find information on him specifically. So Justin, if you're still out there and you happen to be watching this video, drop a comment about Riven for us. I know it was just a fun little side project, but people remember it, enough for it to end up on this iceberg, and it would be cool to see more if you can dig something up. Weird. Truth is stranger than fiction. You know those History Channel documentaries about strange phenomena? Or that show, Unsolved Mysteries? Well, this game is sort of the same idea, but instead of Jonathan Frakes asking you a bunch of personal questions, you're exploring a weird series of rooms, each of which contains information and interactive games that describe unexplained events or legends and folklore. It's like a virtual museum of the unexplained, but some rooms are locked by real puzzles, so that technically makes it a game. But most people would probably call it infotainment media, or something like that. It was released in 1996, and its pacing is very, very slow. Transitions between screens can take a few seconds, and the narrator or text will just sort of appear out of nowhere and start teaching the player about something totally random that they probably weren't prepared to hear about. It definitely prioritizes intrigue in its visuals. It feels like Myst combined with the X-Files intro. And it's honestly kind of a cool way to learn about random cryptids or to hear a spooky story. As with any fact or fiction media, whether it's a book, TV show, or liminal puzzle game, a healthy dose of skepticism is probably wise going in, but if you can get it up and running, this seems like a really fun thing to do with a group of friends on Halloween, maybe, you know? Kill the lights, everyone gather around the computer and just try stuff in this weird, perhaps haunted piece of infotainment software. I don't know. Calmer. While well, a few games on this list can boast being made entirely by one developer, Calmer is perhaps the most striking of those titles. It was made top to bottom, start to finish, by a gentleman living in Hong Kong named Kyle Chua. Chua had no game development experience at the time, and has made nothing else since, and very little is known about him, as his public presence pretty much vanished completely after the game was released in 1998. The interesting thing about Cho is that he also sold and distributed the game himself, with no help from any publisher. Because of this, physical copies of Calmer are incredibly rare, but they were produced and sent out personally by Cho through online orders. If you've seen Adventure Time, there's this subplot about something called the Catalyst Comet, and the idea is that once in a while, a comet passes by or strikes the planet Earth, and causes a drastic planet-wide change. And that's the best comparison that I can come up with for Calmer's story. The player is the 28th Calmer in a long line of exceptional individuals who were destined to change the world. The player is transported to a mysterious land full of architectural wonders and lush nature. The game's environments are serene and peaceful, heavily inspired by Chinese and Japanese architecture, and they add to the game's overall theming, which involves humanity's dwindling connection with the natural world. Cho made Calmer after playing Myst because the experience of Myst convinced him that games were the future of art, 
and that he could convey all of the ideas he was grappling with at the time through a piece of software. The fact that he handled all the production and distribution himself, and that he has never made a game before or since, really showcases that Kalmar was super important to Cho, but despite that, it's probably one of the rarest and poorest selling games on this list. Mast. <clears throat> okay, uh, this one is only known to exist, or uh, speculated still to exist, from a magazine advertisement found in some kind of magazine, maybe a gaming magazine, maybe a different kind of magazine, from the 1990s. And Mast is um, an adult parody of Myst. It's lost media. Like I said, no one is even sure if it's real. I feel weird bringing it up, but it's on the list. So there you go. Welcome to the bottom of the barrel. It's, ma it's Mast. Void. It's very, very hard to find any information about this game beyond gameplay. Also, I learned that there are a ton of games with Void in the title, so what the heck is the deal with that? There's like a million. Anyways, Just Void, no frills, was released in Japan, but its dialogue is in English. Void came out in 1998, and it definitely appears to be inspired by the cyberpunk genre. Its vibe is very Blade Runner. Based on what I can see from reading the box art, the story seems to involve something about reality being a simulation, or a labyrinth of simulations, maybe. A ROM of the game is preserved in the Internet Archive, but this video took enough time to research as it is, so I, I just can't sit down and play a completely undocumented Japanese game from 1998 start to finish. Unless you'd all like to see me livestream it, in which case I'd be happy to. Let me know in the comments. But aside from that basic information, or lack thereof, this game looks really cool, kind of like a Ridley Scott film, and I think that's spectacular. The box art does boast 3D sound, and I gotta say, the sound design does seem to be very on point. It's too bad that there is a, uh, a void of information on this game. <laughs> We're almost done, don't worry. Vitae. This one is here by merit of pure obscurity. No one has really written anything about this game after its release in 1998. It was released in Italian and never localized to English, and there's just so little information on it. Luckily, somehow there is gameplay, and in the game's credits there is a URL, which miraculously has a few snapshots left of it on the Wayback Machine. And according to a synopsis on the website, the protagonist of the game scattered the four elements, water, fire, air, and earth, so now they have to recover them, I think? It's a Google Translate from Italian, so I might be off on what is being said here, but uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds interesting. The developer made some other, even more obscure games. Two of them are in a series called Invocation, and one is just called Blindness. You're a blind man, and your friends are being murdered, so you're investigating and searching your memories for clues. The game is entirely live-action photography and FMVs, and it has a full audio descriptive version for blind players. Yeah, that's a deep cut. Some games are like a bump on the head from just not existing anymore at all. Blindness does not sound real. That's If you told me about that game in a conversation, I would say, no, that's fake. Foresight. Foresight was created by the same developer that made Gadget Invention, Travel, and Adventure. It was released exclusively in Japan in 1995, and you might think that means that you can't play it because of the language barrier, but the game uses no dialogue or text, so it is effectively in a universal language, and it can be played and understood by anyone alive on the planet. So that's pretty neat. Aside from that and the game's obscurity, it has a unique beige and red color palette, and it uses the classic mist prompt of giving the player weird devices to mess with, and just kind of letting them figure out how the world works from there. No real story, just some rusty metal and a can-do attitude. I like it.
Welcome to the future, and welcome to the 91st and final entry on this iceberg. Welcome to the future is the lowest entry, and it's an interesting pick. Just a feline, the creator of this chart, only knew about it through first-hand experience, and the game only sold a little over 10,000 copies. That might sound like a lot, but most of the games on this list, even some of the obscure ones, still sold well over 100,000. Welcome to the Future was released in 1995, and its development seems to share a lot of DNA with Myst. It was made by a small team, just three people getting scrappy in an improvised multimedia company, trying to create the next big thing. The game was an artistic experiment in many ways. The team had no experience making a game, but they did have plenty of experience making music. So, well, the game does feature real, you know, puzzle gameplay, it also functions as a surreal visualizer for the funky tunes that the developers like to make in their spare time. The game was an attempt to push things forward a little, specifically in the raw quality of the visuals and audio. CD-ROMs were still barely capable of playing a sound and showing a detailed image at the same time, so Welcome to the Future attempted to dial things up to 11 by not only using photorealistic pre-rendered graphics, but also making it work with video transitions and music, and not just video game music like what was being tossed around at the time, real instruments and lyrics, fully formed music that you'd hear on the radio. And I've got to say, we've looked at a lot of these games today, and I mean, I'm honestly starting to go cross-eyed from it, they're all blurring together, but Welcome to the Future does have a unique blend of what I think is real landscape photography and like clean but primitive 3D renders. Nothing shocks me at this point, but, but for a first try in 1995, I think I have enough experience now to say that this looks pretty darn good. The game has no real story aside from whatever players decide to piece together from its various elaborate puzzles, and that may be why it stuck with the creator of this chart for so long, because, well, here's the thing. I know this iceberg is incomplete. In fact, I'd be surprised if it even captured most of the liminal point-and-click adventure games in existence. Seriously, this genre barely has a name, and it's, it's massive. I kept finding more stuff as I was doing research and just saying, it's too long, I need to ignore that, I gotta leave that alone, maybe later. And I've seen these titles in their Wikipedia articles or whatever called adventure games or puzzle adventures or mist likes, but again, none of those feel satisfactory to me. We've looked at Weird Core, Dream Core, Atom Punk, Steampunk, Cyberpunk, Frutiger Arrow, Art Deco, Noir, Fantasy, and other visual styles that don't even have names to the best of my knowledge, all spawned from this one weird format of a game where you just put a confused person in front of a bunch of weird shit and make them figure it out. Welcome to the Future is at the bottom of this list because I'm 100% positive that it's not the only one of its kind. There are probably dozens, maybe even hundreds of Welcome to the Futures that only exist as memories to the people who played them. These experiences are so rich and unique that I don't want them to turn into lost media. Luckily, most of what's on this list can still be found and played today, but some of it can't. So if this video awakens a memory in you of a gaming experience that you once had, something liminal, please share it in the comments. And if you don't have one, then hey man, that's cool. Just tell me which of these was your favorite. We can, we can chat about it. Have you played any? You wanna see me stream one? I'm down. And hey, if you like this, if you want to stick around in a, in a fledgling YouTube community, uh, there's a link to join my community Discord in the description below. Uh, we, you know, we get, we get up to some fun in there. I like those guys. Um, so, yeah. I think that's all I have for you. I hope it's enough. This is the longest video I've ever made, that's for sure. Thank you for watching, or probably more accurately, falling asleep to it or maybe just skipping to like the last two tiers of the iceberg because the rest of it was not super interesting to you, which is cool, but sorry, I'm a little tired. So um, thank you for watching everyone and please stay tuned for more, more is on the way.